I think we covered more or less all the bases. I had some reactions. I'll try to go fast. Great. And the general message is I think everybody agrees there is fiscal space. If it's used right, it's good, but many people are worried about the fact that it's not going to be used right. And we're very much in the political economy part of the discussion. Uh, on, the, on the various issues, I mean, w will interest rates remain low for sure? No. It, they might well increase, but we have to think about why. I think for a country like Italy, the reason why the interest rates may just shoot up is because the government becomes irresponsible or they talk of your exit, and then you see the spreads increase enormously. So it's self-inflicted. Uh, it doesn't have much to do with the level of debt. If I look at the spreads that Italy has had over the last uh, year, I think most of the movement in the level was due to some people, not in government, but close, talking about your exit. So I think that's one reason. Yeah, if this happens, that's really trouble. I think the other reason why interest rates might actually increase is that growth prospects become better. But in this case, you know, what matters is R minus G, and therefore this will not be so bad. So, yes, we have to plan taking into account the fact that there are risks, and it could change. But we do this all the time, and we don't impose capital ratios on, on banks of 100%, which would be the riskless thing to do. We choose them so that the risk is small, but not zero, right? So I think most decisions in macro policy or regulatory uh, policy is actually balancing risk, and it seems to me the risk is small. Uh, second point, yeah, debt, let me repeat something I said many, many times in the last six months, debt is bad. <laughs> debt is bad. What it is not is catastrophic. And therefore, if you're going to use debt, you have to use it for something useful so that the benefits exceed the cost. But debt by itself is not a good thing. You don't want to just have more debt. So it matters enormously what you do with the margin of maneuver that you uh, decide to use. So I completely agree with uh, Alberto that there is a risk. I mean, we all think public investment at some level would be good, but we've seen white elephants in the past. Uh, there is an enormous need to do things for global warming, but there is a danger that it's not done right. Something which I think Alberto would like, a few things that Alberto would like, the, uh, is, is cutting taxes in anticipation of reductions in spending later. So you get the expansion, and you get the promise that some reforms will be done on the spending side. And I think this would be one way of proceeding. Let me see if there is... Uh, let me just take maybe two more points. The, on the EU rules, uh, which Veronica uh, raised, I, the, the question is why should there be supranational rules? We understand why there should be national rules, maybe, or principles, but why should there be supranational rules? It has to do with externalities. Otherwise, there is no reason to have them. I can think of two types of externalities. The first one are kind of a dead default externalities, that if a country defaults in some way, then the financial system of that country and other countries is affected, and that's not good. And then the other is demand externalities, which is when you basically spend more, some of it goes to other countries, and you don't get the benefit of that. So my sense is the EU rules were largely designed with the first one in mind, not the second, but we're in an environment in which the first one is less, less relevant because the risk of debt default, I think, is smaller than it used to be. And the demand externalities, when monetary policy cannot be used, are bigger. And I think that's the way we have to rethink about the EU rules, changing basically the trade-off between the two. Um, I had many reactions to many things, so okay. let me see if there's anything else I want to say. I may come back to other issues, but I'll okay. stop here. Very good. Alberto. Yes, thank you. So first of all, let me just say one thing. Uh, Stan kept talking a lot about the Italians at MIT. Let me say there are a lot of Italians at Harvard, too. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, we did not, did not have Franco, but the Italians came anyway. Now, um, of course, uh, Richard, of course, it matters which taxes you cut and which spending uh, you cut and what you do, with, of course. But let me say one thing. There is this view that if you want, if you want to, uh, to cut taxes, you are right wing. If you want to increase the spend, expenditure, you are left wing. And that's what implicitly in the, 
little joke that Olivier said about, uh, said about me. That may be true if, if you're talking about a Latin American country where the, debt of, the spending of the GDP is 15% and only the poor pay taxes because the rich evade them. Uh, but in a country, in a, in a European country where government spending over GDP is 60%, I think, uh, I think that you can certainly cut taxes to the, uh, to the and I would be all in favor to the lower middle class and make, make more redistribution through the tax system and eliminate 5 or 6% of spending over GDP without affecting at all the welcome of the very poor. So it's a little bit, a little bit. Old, uh, it's a little bit old the idea that if you like spending, you're, you're a good guy, left wing, that you like the poor. If you cut taxes, you're a bad guy because you're a right winger. So let's forget about that for a second. Second, um, Charles, you say that we, we all agree on cyclical fiscal policy. Let me clarify a bit. Yeah. We certainly all agree around the table that, spe that um, automatic multipliers should work. So when there is a recession, you should have deficit. When you have a boom, you should have a surplus and all of that. Whether or not you should have an aggressive discretionary fiscal expansion uh, has something to be more debatable. And the reason goes back to what Milton was, Phil, uh, Milton was saying about long and viable lags. He was talking about monetary policy. The long and viable lags of fiscal policy are, are even, even, uh, even bigger. So, uh, you know, one has to be a little, uh, you know, I'm not. It's not obvious that all the sudden, and that and, and and that goes back to the to the other point. Olivier said that uh, we cannot be 100 percent sure when we make a decision. It's of course 100 percent right. Uh, excuse me, the pun uh, is 100 percent right. We should not be 100 percent sure. But, uh, but I would think something perhaps slightly less, uh, slightly, uh, slightly more profound, namely that, that uh, it seems to me that macroeconomists and central bankers tend, they in the past, a market, market uh, operator, in the past they, they tend, they have been wrong in always in the same way, namely in projecting to the future what was happening in the past. So even macroeconomists. When there was the, before the financial crisis, there was the great stagnation, say, sorry, the great moderation, <laughs> and, and, and everybody thought, oh, the business cycle are over, uh, we, need, we need to do anything, we have fiscal rule, monetary rule, wonderful, we are in nirvana. Yes, and there were papers written about that. Then we had the financial crisis, that all of a sudden, the capitalism as we, as we know it, or the human race is gone, we are back to 1929, it's a complete disaster. And so, uh, so uh, then with growth is low for a few years, secular stagnation. So uh, I would suggest a bit more uh, moderation in, in, uh, in projecting to the future uh, the last, uh, the last uh, 20, the last, uh, what happened in the last, uh, in the last uh, uh, 20 years. I, I think that we also, a little bit about this service uh, to our procession to say, uh, to to claim that we know what's going to happen in 20 years, or, 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 or you know, let's try, let's be a little bit more modern. We don't really know, and and uh, and the, the capitalism has worked in a certain way, with ups and down, interest rate going up and down, inflation going up and down, and every time I hear that the new the new uh, the new normal is the the great moderation. The new normal are financial crises every other day. The new normal is secular stagnation. You know, these new normals seem to be changing a little bit too often to be normal. <laughs> Abnormal. Uh, Veronica. Yeah, so um, just to clarify first, when I was talking about uh, at the end of my remarks about um, strength and uh, fiscal automatic stabilizers, I was talking about national national policy. So short of uh, a coordinated fiscal policy, I, was, I wanted just to reinforce that uh, each uh, country should uh, uh, strengthen some fiscal automatic uh, component of the fiscal policy. But going now instead to, to Europe uh, and to the um, how to design better fiscal rule because there has been a lot of discussion about the complexity of the current ones and actually sometimes they're too much complex, sometimes they're too flexible, sometimes they're too tight, it's, it's not clear. And uh, um, there has been a, a, a proposal that I think it's very 
um, appealing, which is instead of uh, talking in terms of caps of uh, the structural deficit, which is something that is hard uh, to measure, uh, especially if you want to cyclically adjust, adjust it, and that creates some uh, cyclical uh, fiscal uh, um, policy. Uh, there has been a discussion about introducing some cap for spending growth, and I think that that's, that's very promising, uh, both because it's easy to calculate, so it's easy to implement, uh, and also because it naturally creates some counter-cyclicality in the, in, the, in the policy. There has been also some proposal that has been uh, done, uh, I mean, that I heard from um, a group of uh, uh, German and, and French economists, seven plus seven, uh, about introducing some form of uh, uh, insurance, unemployment insurance or reinsurance, how they call it, uh, uh, among European countries. And I think that is also a valuable proposal, although I realize that it's very hard uh, to implement. But I think it's good for two reasons. Uh, one, it's because uh, um, it's another form of automatic stabilizer, unemployment insurance. The second is because, of course, I mean, uh, why uh, I'm in favor of contracyclical fiscal policy and saving fiscal space just because each country, if it's alone, needs to self-insure against uh, shocks that hit over time. But if a country has the benefit, uh, or sometimes the cost, but the benefit of being in a, in a, in a union and possibly a fiscal union, um, then uh, it is, in, it is the, the, the great advantage advantage is that you can insure across countries and so this, uh, um, as I was saying before, reduces the need for fiscal pace at the single country, country level. And so I, I think unemployment reinsurance is a good uh, proposal, although I realize that it's difficult, especially in a context where some countries could use it much more than others, so the proposal was kind of a adjusting the, the, the contribution of each country depending on how much uh, each country would use that. Um, so the last thing I want to say is that uh, um, in terms of Italy, uh, so why I, I, I want to push this counter-cyclical uh, fiscal, uh, um, fiscal uh, policy? Well, because uh, unfortunately, I mean, fiscal responsibility in the end is the important thing in terms of spreads if you want to uh, see uh, the markets and how the spreads are going to respond. And, uh, and, and for political reasons, of course, it's always easy, especially in Italy, it's been easy to, as long as, long as you have, uh, as soon as you have some fiscal space to use it. So we always have a tesoretto. As soon as we have a little bit of a fiscal room, there is uh, so the government find a way to use these extra resources uh, in, in any more. moment, independent of, uh, of the expansion. And more. <laughs> exactly. Except, except so, I, I, and I think, I mean, I, I think that I, I realize what, why, did, where this coming from, but, but I think it's not wise, especially if you want to save the country from, from bad period of, uh, of recession when you really need uh, to, to act uh, uh, instead in an expansionary fashion. I'll Stay. stop here. I, I just want to mention, uh, to make two points. The first is uh, a quote from a a book on monetary policy written by John Crow, who was the governor of the Bank of uh, Canada during the 1990s. And he said he made it a rule never to mention fiscal policy. <laughs> he said because he knew exactly what would happen. The next morning the finance minister would call him up and we should get together and we'll make a deal. And uh, you'll... Uh, cut the interest rate, and I'll cut government spending. He said, and I knew what would happen. I would cut the interest rate, and two years later, he'd be coming into my office. Well, I haven't yet been able to convince the Congress uh, to uh, cut, uh, uh, cut spending. And so I just never talked about fiscal policy at all. I managed monetary policy. That sort of backs up what several of you have mentioned as what's wrong with what I was uh, saying. But you agree with John Crow? I don't. Yeah? Well, Do uh, you? I, I, uh, I, let's, let me get to my second point. <laughs> <laughs> my, my second point is very simple. Why this focus on fiscal policy, uh, on increasing it, I, I was so struck by the fact that both parties in the United States 
in the elections were explaining how they were going to go out and build, uh, build infrastructure and everything. Uh, the guy whose side won then went out and passed a bill which he described as being very constructive for the economy and would increase growth by this much and that much. And in fact, it did, very no it did almost nothing for growth. And the uh, evidence on what happened to the tax cuts were that they went almost all to the uh, most wealthy parts of the income distribution. And uh, so I don't think, uh, Charles, that looking at where the cuts are going to have an effect or the uh, increases in, uh, in, in spending if it's, uh, if it's a fiscal expansion, I don't think that looking at how they're going to be divided up among uh, the income distribution is a bad idea. I think if you could actually get them to do their calculations right, it would be a good idea. Charles. Well, I was, I was worried about, I, I, of course, any uh, discussion of income aspects of government spending is absolutely needed. There is no discussion. I was worried that if you do the he strict helicopter money, not your version, but if you do the strict helicopter money, then you get saddle banks deep in income redistribution issues, and that's something I believe they shouldn't be touching. That's the John Crow, I guess, story. Um, I just want to comment a little bit about what Verenica said about uh, a cap on government spending. It's emerging, at least in Europe, as the, as the new solution to uh, fix the Stability and Growth Pact. Um, and the idea is we have moved to targeting the cyclically adjusted budget deficit, and that's so complicated and so imprecisely done that uh, we, it's not a good instrument, so let's find something that the government can really control. The government cannot control the budget deficit, but it can control government spending. And here we are, we home, that's something that everybody can see and that's the right instrument. Simplicity, uh, Francesco style, uh, but maybe too simple. I want to make a few points about that. First. The, the, the government target is supposed to be determined by the growth rate of potential GDP. Ha ha. So we bring back, we don't want to, to, to rely on potential GDP computation, but it comes back through the targets for government spending. So it doesn't come for free. Second, of course, uh, controlling government spending does nothing about controlling the budget deficit. You have the other size of the scissors. So the pro proponent of that have improved their uh, offering by saying, well, we're going to look at taxes without uh, discretional changes and so on and so forth. So now you're not in simplicity anymore. You open the door to all the tax manipulations, the niche and all of these things that exist. Uh, so I'm worried uh, that, that that's that. Uh, finally, um, why should we have a rule that set government spending increasing at any rate? Some countries may want to increase government spending for good reasons. Others may want to cut government spending for good reasons. So enshrining a path for government spending in the, in the Stability Pact, it's sort of a one a solution for a very different bunch of countries, and, I, and I, uh, therefore I don't think it's a good idea. But it's growing, the, the attractivity. Alberto? Yeah, I definitely emphasize that I, com I completely disagree with the cap on government spending for both sort of philosophical, political, and economic reasons. Philosophical is because we don't have any right to tell a country, I want to have 80% spending over GDP, I don't have any deficit, I'm perfectly happy to tax my people 80% because I love government and, and why should you tell me what to do? As long as I don't create deficit, I don't create a financial problem for other people. In fact, it may become another reason why Europe is hated by the hypothetical country that likes 80% spending over GDP. So, so Philosophically and politically, I think, is, 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 uh, is, uh, is, um, is, is, uh, is a bad idea. 
you uh, Gracias, yeah? so I mean uh, I agree with the com compl I mean that is not so easy if once you think about what this cap will be because you have to calculate I mean that it has been proposed together with deciding what is the potential debt uh, or sustainable debt for each country but Still, at least what you are looking at is simple, and uh, and you can. I mean, you, the the rule is going to be simple. I think it's still simplified relatively to the structural debt limit. I think, uh, and uh, and and I mean, you can always grow less than the cap. This is a cap, right? It's yeah. not that the the the, the European uh, countries are going to tell you you have to increase spending uh, by this amount. So, I mean, it leaves you some flexibility in the downside. And I agree, it's not perfect because you impose some 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 rule that and, and the country should have flexibility. But as long as we are in a new union and you want to have some form of control over over a country, I think this is a better measure. If a country is 80% of uh, spending over GDP and no deficit. What kind of a problem is it created to the others? I, it, I mean, the, the, the growth rate, it's not created a big problem, but uh, if you want to control in some way the growth rate of that, uh, assuming that... Has, sure, if you have, if you have like, uh, if you have 100% taxation, but that's the problem, not a problem. The, the, but but the problem are, there is a are, limit to that and the budget constraints somehow... I mean, France, as a, uh, as a country with the highest level of, of spending, Never had any particular deficit problem. What kind of problem is it creating? It's not a perfect. Rule, Maybe creating problem for the French people, <laughs> but not but not for the other Europeans. So I, don't, I'm not, I don't see what the problem is for a country having 80 percent and the other 40. I, I, I thought you wouldn't care because you don't want to increase the yeah. spending anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, as you all can, see, can I, can we I go could, back could, to we, Stan's. We, uh, sorry. Can I go back to Stan's point or not? Go ahead. <laughs> One final intervention. <laughs> final intervention. So uh, I was not convinced by the words of uh, Mr. Quo. Uh, I first, the counter example to this is Clinton Greenspan. It worked. There was a lot of talk behind the scene, and it worked. Hmm. The second is, I think, a more general issue which we have to think about. Can there be central bank independence and coordination? And my sense is yes. Uh, I think that's one of the things that we have to work out in Europe because there is no counterpart to Mario Draghi or to Christine Lagarde. There is no Euro fiscal czar, and that complicates things. But I, I have no logical problem with the notion that you can have an independent central bank coordinating, making contingent some decisions based on what the fiscal authority does. And I suspect that in the current context and in the coming years, it will be essential. Yes, I think I did it. Thank you. We could spend the rest of the evening talking about central bank independence. That's another, yeah. another big bag of, of wool. Uh, but I'm afraid we're past our time. We started a bit late, so I hope you'll forgive us for going beyond the advertised time. Uh, but I think you will all agree that you've been privileged, we've been privileged, to hear the views of an exceptionally a distinguished and experienced panel. Uh, and the only person missing who could have raised the level of the discussion is Francesco. <laughs> uh, but um, he's not allowed, sorry. Uh, uh, I'm sure that he would have wanted to intervene, but not on this occasion. Uh, I think at least he will agree that the level was appropriate, uh, the level and the range were appropriate uh, for an occasion that is in his honor. And uh, we are very grateful to have the opportunity to honor him this evening. So thank you all very much for coming, and thank you to the panelists. Hello. <laughs> yeah. 
le pauvre. Le pauvre.